Hi, and welcome to the Enlightened Humanity Circle Spiritual Rave, where we are helping you learn to access more information by bringing you lots of speakers that are helping you know what is going on in the world. My name is Bonnie Sachs, and I'm here with Lily Winsaft. Hey, everyone. So excited to be here. Together, Lily and I created the 8th Chakra Company, where we are helping people access their information and master what it means to be human. Today, we are here with Mary Giuliani, and she is a transformational coach. Hi, Mary. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Lily. How you doing? We really are good. doing great. We are so excited to have you here today. You have been a great influence for both Lily and I, and we're very excited to hear what you have to say about your story. So if you don't mind, let's just go ahead and jump right in. I would love to hear some great backstory, some information sure. about how you've gotten to where you are today. Well, you, you, no problem, and I, I really do appreciate you allowing me to to share a little bit about my background because so many people that look like they may have it all together, uh, many people don't realize where they've come from. So I think it's so important to share it. Um, you know, I was just raised in a middle-class uh, house in Southern California. However, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, my, my mom, uh, my dad and my mom had a very dysfunctional relationship. They didn't really have any skills on how to resolve conflicts. So there was a constant tension between them and uh, eventually uh, my mom started drinking alcohol to soothe her tension and then my dad started eating um, as well and and so as a child being raised in that environment I was really looking for ways I could soothe myself because it's really uncomfortable to have parents that are you know in chronic tension and so I started using food and so then uh, as I started growing and, and I, I was gaining weight and everything, and I was only like five years old when I started using food, and uh, the tension between my parents was continually escalating through the years, and I started getting bullied in school. And um, it was so hard uh, just dreading going to school, knowing that I would likely be taunted by my classmates, and it really, really hurt my self-esteem and, you know, and... And so it was a very difficult time for me. And I think childhood in general is very difficult, but having the, and I, you know, I know that I'm not the only person that's been bullied or teased, but just this part of my story. And um, so then by the time I was like um, 15 or 16, well, my, we, I was raised Catholic and I was going to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, by the time I was like 15 or 16, I, found drugs and alcohol, and it actually soothed my emotional pain even better than the food. And so I started partying and, and all of that. And um, at the same time, I realized I was attracted to girls instead of boys. And, um, you know, when you're raised in a culture that is this is like in mid seventies, you know, this is when Anita Bryant was going off on all of us. And, and, um, and, you know, like, putting down gays and lesbians and, and uh, was common and not even challenged, actually. Um, so there was another layer of, of shame and, and uh, fear of people knowing who I was there as well. So here I am, I'm drinking, I'm doing drugs, I'm still eating. Uh, my parents are kind of spiraling and my mom's alcoholism is really bad. Um, so it was a really difficult time for me, my family, and I do have one sister. And, and so... So then I, um, I realized that uh, after embracing my party animal for like 10 years <laughs> and realizing, okay, if I keep doing this, I'm going to end up just like my mom, which she was really, my parents had divorced at that point. And I knew it wasn't, I knew what was ahead of me. And so in, and even though it was horrible, it was happening to her. The gift was, as I could see what was going to happen to me if I kept on going. So I went to AA, I got sober and I, um, it really opened up my entire spiritual path for me uh, because when you don't use drugs or alcohol, you end up needing to find something else to help, cope, help you cope with, with just things that you normally would numb out with other things with. So I really got into spiritual growth. I got into science of mind, like where Louise Hay came from. Um, I got into uh, really understanding uh, 
the dynamics of my family through ACA and CODA. And um, what happened was um, I, I ended up really getting sober and, and being able to stay sober and everything. And it was like a miracle and my life really turned around and I started, uh, I started my first business. I, I, my self-esteem got a lot better. I went to OA, started losing weight. But as the years went by, I still noticed that I still was not able to maintain a, a good healthy relationship with food and my body and my weight. So I would gain like a hundred pounds and then lose like a hundred pounds. And, and it was just, horrible. And so I ended up, uh, so I'm 57 now, I was 42 then. I really felt like, you know what, on my own, I'm just not able to handle this for whatever reason. I need a medical intervention. So I had weight loss surgery. And thankfully, I had done a lot of uh, healing around my eating issues, even though I was still struggling with many aspects of it. I ended up losing 100, I was 310 pounds when, before I had the surgery. And so I ended up losing 160 pounds over a couple of years, and I've been able to maintain that weight loss ever since. Yeah, and so, it, it, so yeah, like when people look at me, they're like, oh, you don't have a weight problem. It's like, if you only knew. <laughs> yeah. And so the point is, is that on my own at that time, it just, what I, I wasn't able to, to get that part of my life under control. And, and so anyway, the point is, is that I, I really had to come to terms with uh, just recognizing that sometimes we do need medical interventions. Um, you know, sometimes it's not always just willpower or, or, uh, you know, just bucking it up and, and, and just one more personal growth issue. I, I realized that I had an anxiety disorder from being raised in such a crazy family too. And so I, I didn't realize that that was contributing to a lot of the things that I was doing to try to medicate myself just to feel normal. Um, so after, uh, so, the, you know, the, the main thing that happened for me to help me get into being true to myself and accessing my own inner wisdom was that I had to heal the part of me that my mother told me that I was responsible for her well-being and uh, to put her and other people's needs first. And if I didn't do that, well, and also that I was responsible for her, her emotions. And if I didn't do that, I would be shamed. And so, you know, being shamed is like the most horrible feeling in the world. Shame is the most painful emotion there is. So one of the biggest things that I needed to do to start to tap into my own inner wisdom was to heal that codependency really is what it is. And I started going to CODA meetings and started to really uh, putting myself in environments with people that were healing that part of themselves. And I remember I was at a CODA meeting, which is Codependence Anonymous for anybody that doesn't know. I was at this CODA meeting one day and I remember, I'll remember it clearly. It was like, it was like a major aha moment. It was like, I heard somebody um, share, you know, I really get that it's okay to say no to my mom and I don't have to feel guilty. And it was like, really? Oh my God. I mean, that sounds so simple, but when you're raised with that, you know, put your mother's needs first or you're a bad daughter and a bad person is really what I felt like. It, it was like a major breakthrough. So uh, the point is, is I was able to start setting boundaries with my mother as well as other people. And I was able to um, let go of that part of me that felt like a bad person for having needs because that's basically what it was and so for me the only way we can really access our own inner wisdom is to first know that we deserve to put our needs first and so many women are in our culture are, are i mean it's still rampant in our culture that women are supposed to put other people's needs first and i'm not, I'm not saying women shouldn't be taking care of their children because yes children do need to to get their needs met, but I'm talking about on a broader scale. And um, so anyway, that was the big breakthrough for me. And, um, and so, you know, um, and it's been a, it's, you know, it still triggers me when people tend to, you know, there's certain people in your life when you walk away from an interaction with them where they want you to feel responsible for them and it can be a trigger, but uh, with the right kind of support and, putting yourself in an environment and having friends that are really willing to own that they're responsible for their own feelings, then you can really carve out a life to where it's, it's really based on us all being true to ourselves. Does, does that make sense? 
Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I particularly love about your story is that you weren't afraid to go and find the information somewhere else. You weren't afraid to go to different meetings and, and yeah. seek out information elsewhere, which is really important. A lot of times we think that we have to just gather it from totally. inside. Well, it's like, uh, if you think, like, what is, I think Einstein saying is, um, you can't solve a problem at the level of consciousness uh, in, of where it was created. And so my brain was trained from the time I was an infant, that this is the way you should be in the world to be loved. So I didn't have any other reference point. So I had to get outside help to start deconditioning myself uh, about all of these really self-destructive beliefs and patterns. And, um, you know, when you feel really like a bad person because of that's what you were told who you were by your mother or by the church or culture, uh, you really do have to uh, get a lot of support to decondition that because if you don't decondition that, uh, you'll never feel worthy and you'll be looking for outside approval for the rest of your life. And um, so, you know, that's really uh, a key piece there. Right, right. I agree with you completely. And so for you, accessing your own information, you have learned to do that. Uh, how do you help other people do that? And what exactly does that mean to you sure. from your perspective? Well, for me, um, the first thing is that you've got to heal the beliefs of feeling that you're responsible for other people's well-being or emotions, or you'll literally be led around by the nose by other people's needs and emotions, <laughs> and you'll never be able to access your own ever. Uh, and it's a pro it's, it can be a very challenging process because the truth is, is that when you do that, you are going to get pushback from the relationships that are in your life that are used to you giving yourself up to them. And so you do need to have a support system that will say, you, you know what, Mary, or whoever you are, it's okay that you said no, that even though if this person says, well, you're a bad person, you're not a bad person, that person's projecting their stuff on you and let that go. So having a, a support system of people that, that really can support you in embracing your, your highest path is key. The other piece is... Um, this is one, I worked with a coach many years ago, and he said something that's always stuck with me. And what it is, is that if there's chaos or drama in your life, it's because of just two things. One is that there, your boundaries are too weak, so you need to strengthen your boundaries with people. Boundaries are the rules that we set with other people about how they treat us. And you need to raise your standards. And our standards are the rules that we set for ourselves. And so, um, if, so what I, I support my clients in doing is looking at what area in your life, what relationship are you in that's uncomfortable for you that you're giving more or you're feeling, uh, you're, you're contributing to it out of a sense of duty and obligation versus out of a sense of joy and loving that you're doing it. And, uh, and I support my clients in um, having a, a conversation with that person. And I'll do role plays and stuff like that with clients because a lot of times a lot of people just need the language and having the actual role play experience so that they can feel confident going into it. Um, and uh, as far as uh, setting, I mean, how you can tell if you're in a relationship that works or not is do you leave the interactions feeling energized or drained? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of basic, right? <laughs> um, but so many of us were raised in environments where relationships were draining that we don't think that it's unusual or accept, unacceptable that we tolerate it, you know? The other thing is standards. So like for me, you got to raise your standards. Um, and so when I was like 30 or so and I just got into recovery, I was working as an insurance biller. And at the time, that was the best paying job I could get because I didn't have a college education and, um, and it was a survival job. And as I grew and I uh, expanded my consciousness, I realized that the reason why I hated that job was because I kept walking through the door every Monday through Friday and that I could make a different choice. But I didn't know that before. When you're raised with a, a you know, you just get a job, you're not supposed to like it and it's just what you do. Again, you, you have to expose yourself to new thoughts and ideas. And so I started uh, 
uh, looking for, so I asked myself the question, what kind of uh, field or industry am I really turned on about that I'd like to work in? And I thought, I love personal growth. So I, this was back in the 90s. I literally pulled out like the whole lifetimes and started cold calling therapists <laughs> to see if they needed any work. And I got a job. And, you know, but th that was as a result of doing a lot of personal development work and um, having the courage to do that. And there's baby steps that can lead toward that. But um, the other thing is, so I was raising the standard of my work environment. Then I got into sales and um, in a women's business networking organization because I love women that are embracing their power. So, in, you know, here I am like 30 years old, surrounded by all these women entrepreneurs I'm like a kid in a candy store because that's who I want to be. And uh, so putting yourself in environments with people that you want what they have is so key because then you can see the possibility for yourself. Um, so uh, then once, you know, so you have to like start at all these different levels, just, you know, what, you know, if, you, if you've got the, the shame issues about taking care of yourself, you got to deal with that first. And then once you are taking care of yourself and you've opened up, your calendar to actually focus on yourself, then you can look at, okay, so what is it that I truly love? And one of the best tips that I have found is to write down all of the things that you do, whether they make money or not, just write them down on a list and, comp and, and write down all your skills too. And then as you look at each one of them, just ask your, uh, just check in with your body about how it feels. Uh, and, and what you're looking for is to follow the highest level of excitement. So, um, you know, a lot of us uh, are trained uh, to go after jobs just because we're good at something, even though it might not be what we love. And so, like, the reason I started my talk show uh, is because there's nothing more than I love than being in the conversation of transformation. It's just who I am. It's what I do all the time. <laughs> so I'm like, why not have it be a show? and uh, help other people transform, right? right? And I didn't know if I could make money at it. And frankly, I uh, didn't even care because I knew that it was something I loved. And when you are coming from that place of what you love, you have the energy and the, uh, the commit, you're not gonna burn out because you're, lo you're loving what you're doing. And if you put yourself in an environment where you're supported, uh, you will figure stuff out. I mean, literally, I'm interviewing transformational thought leaders every single week. So I'm building an entire network of these powerful women and men that are going for it in their lives. Of course, I'm going to be coming up with new ideas, right? Yeah. So I have, a, I have a question for yes. you, about that, Mary. Yes. Um, because in the area of loving what you do, a lot of people do struggle with that. With They yeah. have an idea and they have something in their heart that they really want to do, but to bridge that gap between thinking of what I want to do and actually doing it. Is right. there anything that you could share about when that moment happened that you thought about having a talk show and then you actually did it? Like, was there something that you could yes. share with us that would, that would help people to bridge that gap for themselves? Absolutely. That's a great question. And I actually stayed stuck in the how for many years and, um, the, the problem with that is most of, most of us are raised with the idea that we need certainty or a clear path before we start. And so I started uh, going to Kyle Cease, who's a transformational uh, seminar leader. Uh, he's a former stand-up comedian. And one of the things that he supported us in doing is knowing that you're going, your, your, your intention is to be true to yourself and, and to really honor your highest calling, even if you don't know what it is. So you have to fall in love with not knowing and taking the next indicated step. So it's sort of like a GPS system. It's like when you, you, know, you turn the GPS in the car, it doesn't give you every single step, it gives you the next step. And so we have to fall in love with just knowing, does this next step bring forth aliveness in my body uh, or not? And, uh, and for, like I said before, it's important to pick uh, people around you that will support you in that because people that won't, people can only support you at the level that they've risked and been uncomfortable and been willing to step outside of their comfort zone. But the point is, is that I threw myself into his training and um, 
and, you know, did a lot of exercises on what do I love that brings the highest level of excitement into my body. And so I decided to take a leap. That's the other piece is being willing to take a leap out of something that you're doing. Like, for example, I had a business with my former partner. She was a romantic partner and a business partner. And we had uh, ended our relationship. And so I was at a turning point where, do I want to stay in this business and stay as business partners or uh, do my own thing? Well, the safe thing would have been, I've helped build this business. There's a steady income, but it's not my passion. And it's, not, it's just not the healthy thing for me. I need to do my own thing, right? So it was a big leap. And so you have to be willing to risk and trust that you will be supported. So, um, you know, I'm 57. It's like, okay, so I'm just going to like give up a, a, a steady income for this leap, you know? And so I didn't even know I was going to start this talk show when I let go of that, that business relationship. Um, but I trusted that if I did take the leap that I would be supported and I would figure it out and I didn't need to know exactly. It was the most uncomfortable thing I think I've ever done, but uh, I wouldn't even be here if I hadn't. And so, uh, but you have to, again, you have to put yourself in an environment where, where other people are leaping and you can see that it's possible. So with his program, he, he does these like 2000 seat seminars. And so there's people that are in these seminars that have already leapt and that are having amazing things happen. So you get to go, oh, so it can happen for me because other people are doing it. Um, my old motto used to be, I wouldn't even consider a venture unless I checked the mark. I was like very entrepreneurial, you know, how viable is it? And what's the market like? How much money can I make? And so this has been a totally different way for me to operate. And it's been the greatest gift for me because, um, Without that kind of support and watching other people risking and leaping, I wouldn't have gotten in touch with what I really loved. And um, one of the things that he, uh, Kyle Cease talks about is from this movie uh, adaptation, there's this quote that says, you are what you love and not what loves you. And so the point of that is, what do I love regardless of whether anybody else approves of it or loves it? And so that was the, sort of my guiding uh, light. And that's when it was like, well, I love being in the conversation of transformation. Mm -hmm. So when I started the show, the way I looked at it was, I need to, I choose to let go of whether anyone even watches it because I just want to do it because I love it. And so it's a very different paradigm to operate from, especially with my entrepreneurial background. I, you know, I ran two successful businesses and I never started my businesses that way. But I never have had the joy and the fulfillment in this business that I had in those, even though I, you know, so. Um, well, well, that's, that's a fabulous nugget to, for our audiences to do what you love. And we hear that all the time, but kind of like what we were saying, sometimes it's, it's easy to think about it, but then a little bit harder to put into, into motion. But we're almost running out of time, but I would love to hear if you have, because those are some really wonderful things that you've said, and, and can you think of maybe a golden nugget that you can leave for our audience if they are struggling with an addiction, or it doesn't even have to be substance abuse or anything. Yeah, like, process addictions, yeah. Yeah, you used um, uh, using food, you know, and I don't tend to think of food as like an addictive thing, but I so do know that, that you know, we mm -hmm. use food to calm our nerves and our anxiety, so. Right. What can someone do today, let's say, when they, after they listen to this interview, what can they do if they are struggling with some kind of way of, of soothing their anxiety and not knowing quite how to follow through with their dreams? What's something that they can do to make that leap? Well, that transformation. Yes, leap, absolutely. Know, absolutely. I know for me, when I, you know, I still struggle with food, uh, not, nothing like I did before, but it, it's... Um, it's a barometer. You, if we can look at any of our behavior, that there's something going on that we're trying to soothe. And so if we can look at, so what is this, and not judge the behavior. And I think that's the big thing is we get into judging and shaming ourselves. 
And you know what? We're all human. We all have addictions on whatever level, whether it's work. I mean, actually 35% of adults admit that they're workaholics Mm -hmm. and it's actually celebrated in our culture. So, you know, yeah. So instead of beating ourselves up about it, it's like, okay, so um, what, what is it like if I don't work, what kind of feelings are going to come up for me? And how can I get in touch with what I really am hungry for or I'm really wanting in my life? Um, and, and by the way, uh, the reason why it took me so long to do my, my uh, purpose was because I hadn't healed the part of me that was so focused on, on fixing and rescuing other people. And so it didn't give me the opportunity to really get in touch with myself. So you have to start with, wherever you are, whatever the challenge is. So if you're struggling with addictions, um, really just ask, journal, do some mindfulness, uh, and just ask yourself, what is it that I'm really hungry for? And um, you'll be amazed at if you write about that and journal about that, what, what it is. And usually it's because you're in a relationship that you're not setting boundaries in, you're in a job that you're not liking, you're in you know, something that is not being true to you. And it's, and so you're trying to soothe yourself with these external things and then get the support you need to start making the changes because a lot of people feel helpless and hopeless because maybe they were raised in environments where it was helpless and hopeless. Like I was, (laughs) um, and about, I don't know, probably 50% of us are raised in crazy households. So, um, just, Anyway, Brene Brown, by the way, has been another really, really key person in helping me heal a lot of my own shame stuff. And um, so, in, you know, uh, just be gentle with yourself. Be compassionate with yourself. We are all truly doing the best we can. And um, if you can just be aware and, and then write about it and then put yourself in. I, the, I think the, the last thing and the most important thing, my a- advice is, with the right consistent support, you can access your power and overcome any of these things. So get the support you need. Join a group, watch my show, get a coach, get friends that are on this path. You know, the seven people that you spend the most time with are going to be your future. So look at the people you're spending the time with and recognize you don't have to like kick them out of your life, but start bringing people into your life that are really going to influence you and moving in a direction that uh, will support you. Wow, that's really great, Mary. Wow, I, I think Thanks. I could probably talk to you for hours and I'm sure Bonnie agrees. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's a, and a, oh my gosh, everything that you talk about, your message is about hope, it's about you know whatever trauma we might be going through or whatever history mm-hmm. we might be challenged with and, and moving right. In our life there is hope there are resources all we have to do is look within and and be able to receive the resources that yes. are available to us so yeah so much for that message and I want to encourage okay. everybody to check out Mary's website and get on her show it's on it's usually on Wednesday nights right Mary? it's every Wednesday night at uh, seven o'clock at marygiuliani.net yeah Yep. Okay, good. And it's at 7 p.m. Pacific time. So That's right. please make sure that you subscribe and get on the channel and allow yourself to listen to all the experts that Mary is bringing on board. And transformation is really the way to go. Bonnie and I are all about transformation. And I really want to thank everyone for joining the Enlightened Humanity Circle Spiritual Rave today. We are all about transformation and helping you master what it is to be human by connecting with <laughs> in wisdom. So stay tuned in till next time. All right. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.